I'm Matt O'Donnell. I'm the Dean Emeritus here. He used to do this. They let me back for one. So I thank everybody very much for being able to host this one. I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us for the final presentation of this year's 2016 Engineering Lecture Series, City Smarts, Engineering Resilient Communities. This is a, a series, as it has in the past. This year is a partnership with UW Alumni Association and the College of Engineering. If you're not a member, you should be a member, OK? There's lots of uh, good things that go with it. And you can uh, find out more at the website for UW Alumni Association, UW Alum, as you might have guessed, dot com. OK, so tonight, tonight's the last in this series. And this morning, I thought it was absolutely appropriate. I was doing my exercises early in the morning, NPR is in the background. And what do I hear is that the EPA just enacted a stricter water quality rules for Washington State. So I knew what I was doing tonight. So of course, I go click. What the hell is the new water, EPA water regulations? And there was you know, 37 dash, I, I don't know what these certain statutes are. But I found a, so a little over 100 substances uh, related to 65 compounds are tracked by the EPA, but they only actually actively monitor a few toxins, such as dioxins and things like that, uh, in our water supplies. But did you know there's 80,000 chemicals out there? 80,000, several thousand new ones every year. And the EPA, just higher standards, is monitoring just a few of these. Well, where do these substances go? They go somewhere. And so many leave chemical traces or fingerprints in the water that linger for years and impact our salmon populations, animals and plants, and in fact, our own health and safety. So tonight's speaker will help us understand the scope of this issue, and I hope describe some ways we can engineer solutions to maintain our water so sources. So who do we have tonight? Well, you will see quite a contrast between short and tall in just a few seconds. <laughs> and this talk will be given by Ed Kologe, who's uh, joined the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering in September 2014 as part of the UW uh, Freshwater Science Initiative. It's a very interesting initiative between uh, UW Tacoma and UW Seattle. So he, owns, uh, he holds a joint faculty appointment with interdisciplinary arts and sciences at UW Tacoma and is a member of the College of Engineering's uh, a Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and is also a member of the Center for Urban Waters in Tacoma. Very interesting uh, institute. Maybe we'll hear a little bit about that tonight. His research interests include water quality and contaminant fate in natural and engineered systems. Now, we in academics like that he's published well. He's been in science, other major journals, but what's really cool is the media's caught on. So he's been there for Nature, Scientific American, US News and World Report, Yahoo News, BBC. Any others, Ed? Uh, there's other ones. OK. But the list is too long, and we should get on with the talk. So please join me in welcoming Ed Kologe. Well, thanks for that kind introduction. I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight. So the theme of our engineering lecture series this year, right, is resilient cities. And tonight I really want to make a case that if we're going to consider resilient cities, we really need to consider how we think and manage the chemicals that we're producing and using and discharging out into the environment. Now, everyone in this room knows there's a lot of people on Earth, mostly in urban areas. We also know that all those people make a wide variety of synthetic chemicals that we really use as part of our daily lives, right? We make pharmaceuticals to keep us healthy. We make pesticides and fertilizers to grow our crops and feed us. We make plastics, you know, all sorts of crazy chemicals that are in our clothes, in our houses, in our cars. What people don't really think nearly as much about is what happens to all these chemicals after we're done with them. In a lot of cases, they don't actually magically disappear, right? They actually linger in the environment. And in fact, when you go out in the environment, you can actually find this chemical fingerprint composed of all these chemicals that we're making and using and discharging in a lot of places where you look. You can find our synthetic chemicals in our forests and the soil under them. You can find them in the water around us, the air we breathe, 
the organisms that live in those environments, even humans, for sure, were an organism in an aquatic environment. Um, really, there's nowhere you could go on Earth where you can't find some trace, some trace of chemicals that humans have produced and used and has been discharged out into the environment. How does that relate to cities? Well, cities are places that concentrate people and resources together, right? And cities are also places that concentrate chemical pollution and all the adverse impacts of human actions. And um, it turns out that in cities, if we can figure out our problems around urban water and urban pollution, cities are the places with the resources to investigate these problems and then do something about them once we figure out what the best solution is. So I wanted to start uh, thinking about resilience with this analysis that was published in Science uh, in 2009 by a research group led by this guy Rockstrom, right? And Rockstrom and his team of researchers basically made this case that planetary systems are resilient if human actions are operating within their safe boundary spaces, right? And they define this figure here. A um, little bit hard to see, but these darker circles, that's a boundary area. And if a human action for climate change or land system change or using fresh water is within this center green area, it's basically safe. You don't have to worry too much about it. But you exceed this threshold boundary, you get up into the yellow region, that's an indication that you're in a zone of uncertainty. There might be some adverse impacts happening from that action. And if you get out here into the edge, you exceed this final threshold value into the red zone, right? That's an area where human actions are expected to have a significant adverse impact on some important planetary system, right? So really we wanna make sure that humans are staying away from these red areas and we're operating within our safe boundary places because that's a resilient system. So you'll notice on this figure that there's this interesting label up here, novel entities, right? What, is, what does that mean? Well, in the original 2009 paper, that was originally chemically, uh, chemical pollution. But in 2015, it was updated to novel entities to reflect the fact that in addition to all these synthetic chemicals that we're making, uh, we're also making things like nanomaterials and genetically engineered organisms. And so even though this Rockstrom Research Group felt that the boundary was really important for all these novel entities, they didn't feel they had enough data to quantify it, even though they thought there was the potential for great impacts in that category due to our production and use of all these novel entities with toxic characteristics. So really this is an indication that we have insufficient data here. We don't really have enough information to really accurately assess what all these chemicals we're producing, uh, putting out in, into the environment, into organisms, even into our own bodies, what that really means for us. So even though we really haven't addressed uh, these chemical boundaries holistically for, a chemical, for groups of synthetic chemicals as a whole, there are some planetary boundary estimates for individual chemicals. And here I put one up that we're probably all familiar with, right? DDT, kind of a famous chemical. Um, DDT actually has some good characteristics. It's actually a really effective insecticide, which has probably saved uh, many billions of dollars in crop value since it was first started being used in the 1940s. One reason it's effective is that it's long lived out in the environment. Um, DDT is considered a recalcitrant compound. It's difficult for environmental processes to break it down. In fact, DDT actually exists out in the environment for decades and even centuries. Um, DDT still has a use in public health. Um, it can be used in less developed countries to prevent malaria, which is a disease that's killing something like 700,000 people a year. And for reasons like that, we're still producing and using around 3,500 tons of DDT globally. But we don't know about DDT because it's a good chemical, right? We know about DDT because it's bad. It's kind of a classic case of a bad chemical. Um, in addition to being toxic to insects, DDT is actually toxic to birds and fish as well. It's a probable human carcinogen. That's not good. It bioaccumulates in the food chain. So as you move higher in the food chain, concentrations go up. In fact, even though DDT was banned in 1972, um, traces of DDT and its metabolites are detectable in every single person in this room here tonight, right? So it hasn't even been used in the US for 40 years, but we still have it all within our bodies. DDT is globally transported. DDT was used nowhere near the Arctic, but polar bears have really high concentrations of DDT in their bodies. And DDT is an endocrine disruptor. It disrupts calcium uptake into bones and things like eggshells. So it results in eggshell thinning for apex predators like bald eagles and brown pelicans. 
When researchers first started noticing localized extinction of these species in the 1960s, that's really what led to the ban of DDT in 1972. We couldn't make the bald eagle go extinct, too. Uh, that, was really, that would be traumatic for us, us Americans, right? So because we have all this information about DDT, we can actually calculate things like a planetary boundary. We can really evaluate the risk or safety of DDT, uh, the use of DDT out in the environment, right? And that was an analysis that was done by Selbeck in 2014. And basically, Selbeck concluded that because of all these toxic characteristics or harmful attributes, that DDT would exceed its safe space. It'd be way out in that red region, in that original uh, resilience diagram. DDT is also a really good example of unintended consequences. We deal with a lot of problems as environmental engineers that are basically results of things that we didn't expect to happen. We didn't maybe think through an action or an activity very well before we started to do it, and somewhere along the line we figured out, hey, that's a big problem. We need to do something about it. That's really causing us a lot of uh, difficulty, both for either for humans or ecosystems and things like that. Engineers often work on solving these unintended consequences. That's actually a big thing that a lot of environmental engineers do. Um, the real problem with them as a society is that unintended consequences are costly and difficult. They take us a lot of time. We use a huge amount of societal resources on them. So we should really pay a lot of attention to cautionary tales like DDT because they point us toward where unintended consequences might pop up. So what I want to really cover this evening, right, let's think about resilient urban communities in a chemical context. I'll give, us, uh, give you a few examples about chemical production and how we screen for chemical safety and risk. We'll talk about a few research developments about the occurrence of chemicals out in the environment. We'll think about their potential impacts on ecosystems and humans. And finally, we'll take a look at a few solutions that might lead us toward those resilient cities, that might give us those city smarts that we're going to need to manage this problem of synthetic chemical production, use, and discharge. So really, in a Seattle context, we know Duwamish is a problem, right? That's a classic example of chemical pollution impacting our environment that costs us a lot of resources. We want to avoid Duwamish 2, 3, and 4. We want to see if we can head them off before they happen. So production and screening. So like Matt mentioned here in the introduction, we're producing something like 80 or 85,000 chemicals here in the US. In the US, we make something like 50 billion kilograms of chemicals every single day somewhere, right? And what's even more important to notice is that globally, our chemical production is increasing. So I've put up this figure here from the ACS Chemical and Engineering News, which basically projects population and chemical production out to 2050. And we can see that global populations are expected to grow a bit, be 30 or 40% higher. But more importantly, we see that chemical production is expected to grow quite substantially, to maybe be, to maybe be three, four, five times higher than it is now, right? And that's an indication that there's an affluence effect occurring on Earth, right? We're not just getting more people on Earth, but we're getting people who are using the Earth more intensely. They're using, producing, and discharging more chemicals. So if you have a new car, there's about $3,500 worth of chemicals in it. If you have a new home, $15,000 worth of chemicals. So as more and more people get new cars and new homes, our chemical production is going to scale disproportionately, much more dramatically than income does, uh, excuse me, and then population does. This data tells us we can expect lots more growth in production, and we're going to see a lot more discharge of synthetic chemicals out to the environment. So what can engineers do about that? Well, engineers are really the people that build technologies that mitigate the adverse impacts of human actions, right? And to kind of illustrate this example a little bit, I turned to kind of a famous equation in sustainability science. Uh, this is the IPAD equation. It says the environmental impact of a human action is not just a function of population, which is often something we think about easily, but also affluence. That really represents the intensity of an action, how intensely humans are using resources, as well as the technology that humans are applying toward that action. Sometimes technology makes human actions worse, but engineers are often the people who are building technologies to mitigate um, the adverse impacts of human actions. And that's really where engineers have a role in this problem. So engineering, we're going to move the needle by building good technologies to offset these affluence impacts that seem to be happening globally. 
So if you want to do something, just like maintain the status quo here on Earth, right? You don't want things to get worse out in the environment. You don't want more chemicals going out in the environment. If this population times affluence term is four or five times higher, that tells us that our technologies are going to need to be four to five times better if we just want to maintain the status quo. So the iPad equation is actually a good way of kind of giving a design objective to our engineering teams. It tells us where we need to get to to maintain the status quo, or maybe in some cases to even improve our environmental health, our water quality, our air quality. So um, it's important to know that here in the US, there's really a big gap between our regulatory capabilities and the demand for understanding chemical safety. We have 85,000 chemicals, right? We're making 1,000 new ones per year. And yet, when you look at the US regulatory capabilities, the ability of the EPA or the Food and Drug Administration to really evaluate their safety, these circles are to scale. We can just do a few per year, right? In 1976, in the US, we passed, passed the Toxic Substances Control Act. Um, since that time, we've been able to screen chemicals at about five to seven per year. The EPA has done about 250 under TSCA. And when you include other legislation, like the Clean Water Act, we've managed to look at maybe 1,200 chemicals or so. There's a big difference between 1,200 and 85,000, right? In that 40-year period, we've banned five chemicals, and we've managed to label very, very few, maybe a few dozen, as carcinogens or toxic. And that's largely because the people who are producing and making chemicals um, don't like it when their chemicals are labeled carcinogens or toxic. We kind of have a slow process that just is not very efficient at collecting data and then doing something about it, like banning a chemical that's problematic. Here in the US, we also have no safety screen prior to use. If you're a chemical manufacturer, you don't actually have to collect a lot of data on chemical safety before you start to manufacture it. Production and ingredient data is considered proprietary. It's legally protected. So if you have something like a hydraulic fracturing fluid, we're using huge volumes of it. We're pumping it out to the environment so we can get natural gas and oil back. There's no responsibility for, of anyone to actually release the ingredient list or understand what chemicals are in those mixtures. And that's kind of a real problem when it comes to environmental health and safety and understanding the consequences of human actions on the environment. So here in the US, I'd say we have a regulatory paradigm, a way of thinking about chemicals that says, if a chemical makes you money, then you go ahead and make it. We'll worry about it later. That's really in stark contrast to places like the EU that use more precautionary principle type approaches to chemicals, where you have to prove that something is safe before you can go and use it. In the US, we prove it's harmful, and then we try and ban it later. That's a slow process, and it's really inefficient. As an example of this, I'll point to a chemical that um, I've been working on a little bit, this agricultural pharmaceutical <laughs> called Ultranagist. It's this molecule up here in the corner if you like molecules, right? So Ultranagis is actually a potent steroidal progestin that's actually really widely used as an estrus synchronizer in animal agriculture. Well, what that means is that uh, if you give Ultranagis to an animal or a group of animals, you can actually control the timing of reproduction. And that's really important if you want a constant supply of pork chops or bacon or steaks down at the supermarket, you need to make sure that all your animals are basically reproducing on a very controlled schedule so you can produce meat throughout the year. That's not really the way nature works. So Ultranagist is the pharmaceutical that big animal ag, industrial agriculture, uses to accomplish this outcome. If you're an animal receiving Ultranagist, you'll get a dose of something like 150 to 360 milligrams per animal over a 10 or 20 day period. I'm going to contrast that here with ethanyl estradiol, which is a component of human birth control pills. We've heard a lot of stories in the last five or 10 years about birth control pills in water. If you're a human female taking a birth control pill, roughly the same pharmaceutical application, you might take 7.5 milligrams of ethanyl estradiol every year, much, much less than that dose. So you think about things like agriculture. That's actually a big source of pharmaceuticals to the environment. We very rarely associate agriculture with pharmaceuticals, but there's a lot of pharmaceuticals and antibiotics that are used in industrial agriculture. Altrinagist, if you use it in swine production, it's called Matrix. If you use it in horses, it's actually called Regumate, as in regulate mating. That's actually the trade name of Altrinagist. Incidentally, I pulled these pictures off the manufacturer websites for these products. 
Um, and I was kind of struck by the fact that they show this happy pig in the middle of a field, right? <laughs> I, I can assure you that industrial swine production looks nothing like this. Um, those pigs never see the sun, they never see grass, and they're never more than a foot away from all their companions, right? This picture of horses, I think maybe these are horses that are supposed to be dating or something like that. This might be a little bit more accurate. So if you go onto Google, right, and you try and find an environmental impact assessment for a product that's called Regumate, the top search on Google will come up with a nine-page document that was last updated in 2003. And basically, that document says that Altrinagist is not extensively metabolized. And what that data says is that really, those animals that are taking Altrinagist can be expected to excrete it out in the environment unchanged, which is actually a really common occurrence for a lot of pharmaceuticals. One way to make an effective pharmaceutical is just to make sure that your body doesn't convert it into something else. So it's really typical for a lot of the drugs that humans and animals take we excrete them out in the environment unchanged, right? Um, the data in that environmental impact assessment took a look at the effects of altrinogist on soil carbon and nitrogen cycle microorganisms. They also looked at the effect of altrinogist on the growth of higher plants, right? And basically, the one page of data in that environmental impact assessment concluded that altrinogist was safe for lettuce, radish, wheat, and soy and it was expected to have no significant impacts on the environment. If you go into the scientific literature, you look at something like Web of Science, and you look up altrinogist and water, right? Kind of a, a, a logical two terms to put together. Up until this year, you actually found no results. Uh, a little earlier this year, um, some collaborators and I published uh, the first paper up thinking about altrinogist and water, right? So I point to this compound because here we have a product which is actually called Regumate, regulate mating. We only give it a nine-page environmental impact assessment. We don't consider its effects on fish, what happens to it when we release it out into water or any other really environmental compartment. So I think Altrinogist is a great example of why there's a high probability for us to expect unintended consequences sometimes. We don't really have a system that's capturing a lot of data about these chemicals before we manufacture a whole bunch of them and release them out into the environment. So where does pollution come from, right? So lots of people have this stereotype about pollution, especially in water or air, that these big point sources are the problems. When people think about pollution, they think about some big factory, right, with a big smokestack spewing all these toxins up into the air, or these big pipes discharging all this dirty, foamy water into our waterways, right? But in actual, uh, actually here in the US, big point sources are actually really well managed. We've been working on this problem as engineers for like 50 years, and we've actually got it mostly under control, I would say. Um, there are a few exceptions, and maybe I'd point to municipal wastewater effluent, this big pipe of treated uh, wastewater sewage that goes out into our receiving waters after we're done using that water. That might be uh, an exception uh, of a point source we, know we still need to think a little bit about and maybe improve our treatment capabilities for. If you look at data from the Washington Department of Ecology, they basically say only about 10% of toxic loadings to Puget Sound are coming from these point sources. So this is really not the right picture for us when we think about environmental pollution. So I'm an engineer, right? Lots of engineers in the room. Hopefully there's some chemical and environmental engineers in the room. That's what my background is. I wanted to show you a mass balance tonight, right? So let's take a look at a mass balance of ibuprofen in municipal wastewater, right? Ibuprofen is the active ingredient in Advil, right? Lots of us take over-the-counter pharmaceuticals like Advil when we have a headache or you know, a little bit of joint pain or something like that. And on average, in the United States, people take about five capsules of ibuprofen per year. So that's about one gram per capita per year. Uh, we also use about 100 gallons of water, each of us, every day. That's about 138,000 liters per year. And if you divide those two numbers by each other, right, the mass over the volume to make a concentration, you come up with a predicted concentration in municipal wastewater for ibuprofen, which, like altrinogist, is basically excreted by humans unchanged. Uh, you come up with an entry concentration in the environment of around seven micrograms per liter. So that's the concentration we might logically expect to find in a big point source like a municipal wastewater effluent that we're discharging out into a river or a lake or Puget Sound. 
And I could do a similar mass balance like this for dozens, hundreds, and even thousands of, of compounds, all with like roughly the same numbers. The numbers up here change a little bit, right? This number varies. But for many, many compounds, you can ex reasonably expect low microgram per liter concentrations for most wastewater-derived pollutants. And then a lot of them do have some attenuation and degradation processes. So nanogram per liter is far more likely after you account for all these environmental attenuation processes. Here's an example in Puget Sound, right? This is sucralose. Lots of us know this uh, compound as Splenda, right? It's right over here. Um, sucralose is an artificial sweetener. It has no calories. Why does it have no calories? It's because it doesn't break down in your body. Your body can't extract any energy from it, so it's a zero-calorie artificial sweetener. Well, we shouldn't be surprised then when we put sucralose out in the environment that nothing happens to it. When we try and treat it in a wastewater treatment plant, nothing happens to it there either. It's a chemical structure that's resistant to breakdown. Um, so when people like Joel Baker and Andy James, some researchers down at the Center for Urban Waters, have looked for sucralose throughout Puget Sound, sucralose is basically pervasive in Puget Sound. You basically find it everywhere. It was detected in 94% of Puget Sound samples, with con uh, concentrations averaging about 20 nanograms per liter. And most of all this is coming from wastewater sources. So it's a good example of you know, our chemical fingerprint coming from things like artificial sweeteners, oftentimes highest in concentration near our major metropolitan areas. So what's the pollution reality if it's not those big giant smokestacks and big ugly effluent pipes, right? The pollution reality is really that non-point sources matter more. In fact, the cumulative effects of small dispersed pollutant sources are really what seems to be driving most adverse impacts out in the environment. I put a few examples up here, right? Here's a picture of some urban stormwater. It has some motor oil. Uh, urban stormwater is full of things from cars, like lubricants, a lot of car care products, you know, the waxes and polishes you put on your car. It has antifreeze in there, brake fluid, you know, your windshield washer fluid, all these things. So there's a huge suite of diverse synthetic compounds in something like urban stormwater. Around our homes and lawns and yards, we use all sorts of nutrients and fertilizers. We use all sorts of pesticides. A good example of pesticide use in residential areas comes from California, right? California's Central Valley is one of the most agriculturally productive regions on Earth. You don't actually find the highest concentrations of pesticides in the Central Valley way out in the agricultural areas. In fact, the city of Sacramento is actually the pesticide hotspot in California's Central Valley. That comes from people using uh, pesticides like pyrethroids around their yard for controlling ants and termites and things like that. So usually we, we associate pesticides with agriculture, but actually people on their lawns doing something like this turn out to be really big sources of some of these problematic compounds. So really, altogether, all these little polluted runoffs, all these dispersed pollutant sources add up to big problems when you consider them collectively. And I really think the best mentality to have when you think about chemicals going out in the environment is that everything we use will eventually end up in water. It's not true for all compounds, but it's a good place to start. It's, it's, the, right, it's the correct mentality to have when you start thinking about this problem. So um, another example here. So I like this example. This is an article that was published by the Puget Sound Institute in 2014, and it was titled, Citizens of the Leading Cause of Toxics to Puget Sound. And I really like this paragraph in it. New research presented at the 2014 Salish Sea Ecosystem Conference shows that some of the greatest dangers to Puget Sound marine life come from our common, everyday activities. These pervasive sources of pollution are so woven into our lives that they're almost invisible to us but it's becoming impossible to ignore their effects. And I think that's really a classic case of what I'd like to call thoughtless pollution, right? These everyday activities we're doing, these habitual things that we do without even thinking about them, of all our individual citizens that together, when you consider them collectively, they're now the leading source of toxic chemicals to Puget Sound. So I want to show you another example about thoughtless pollution. Let's just focus on hand soap for a bit. About a month ago, I was in Washington, D.C. at a conference, right? I was at the Washington Marriott at Metro Center Hotel. The conference was low down in the hotel here. And between a break and sessions, I went to wash my hands in the bathroom, right? 
And the bathroom had the automatic water and soap dispensers. And as I washed my hands, the soap dispenser was set such that it just kept discharging soap into the sink. And I washed my hands, and it probably discharged you know, six or seven or eight squirts of soap into the sink. It's a little hard to see with the lighting here, but there's a little puddle of green soap here that runs down into the drain. And this all happened, you know, this was an accidental, incidental discharge. It wasn't the soap I wanted to get from that dispenser. I went around and looked at the other sinks, and actually four of the six sinks in that bathroom had the same exact soap plume, which told me that lots of these sensors were incorrectly set. So hand soap, you know, we think of it as a single product, but it's really a complex mixture of synthetic chemicals. It contains things like triclosan, triclocarban, ureas, diethanolamine, parabens, lots of synthetic fragrances and colors, detergents and oils. That's a whole suite of synthetic chemicals that are going down the drain from this hand soap plume. So being an engineer, I did a mass balance on the hand soap, right? <laughs> that, that makes me happy. Um, I estimated that we had about one milliliter of hand soap in that sink. It was present in four of the six sinks in that bathroom. I counted the sinks on that floor. There were about 40 of them, and there was 15 floors in that hotel. Uh, I figured each sink down low was used about 10 times per hour. That's where all the people were in the restaurants and conference facilities. There was a lot of traffic in and out, right? Maybe up higher in the hotel, I figured they're used about four times per day. And if you just run that mass balance, you see in that one hotel, every single day, something like four to seven liters of hand soap would be discharged unintentionally. This is not accounting for the hand soap that we're using intentionally, right? And so we have a gallon or two, right? Hmm. Maybe you get concerned about that, maybe not. It's not a huge amount. But when you scale these types of things up to cities, they suddenly become consequential. These numbers suddenly get a lot bigger and more real, right? So we're looking at one product, hand soap, from one industry, the hotel industry. And if you normalize to the number of hotel rooms in that building, there's about 460 in the Washington Marriott, um, you can estimate that there's about 9.5 milliliters of unintentional discharge per hotel room per day. Scale that to Seattle as an example with its 35,000 hotel rooms, and you might expect 330 to 660 liters of unintentional discharge of something like a hand soap. Putting that in pollution units that we're more comfortable with and more familiar and feel more intuitive to us, that's like two to four barrels of hand soap going out to Puget Sound every single day from this accidental pathway. And I think we all know that if this was a factory or an industry or some you know, big box with big smokestacks over on the side, and we were told that, hey, that industry is discharging two to four barrels of pollution out into Puget Sound every day, we'd want to do something about it. That would be societally unacceptable. But the reality is, is because that impact is spread across all the people, and it comes from a habitual thoughtless action, we end up really not thinking much about it, even if it's a really important source of chemicals to our receiving waters. You do that same type of analysis across all the other products and all the other chemicals and all the industries we have, and suddenly you have really significant numbers for toxic loadings. So everything else, that's lots more barrels of pollution that are going to hit Puget Sound from these sources. In fact, the Washington Department of Ecology says something like 6 to 43 million kilograms of toxic pollutants are loaded into Puget Sound every year, most of which is coming from non-point source pathways. So what do we detect in water? Well, the first thing I'll say about detecting chemicals in water is that the companies that make analytical instruments do a wonderful job. Every single year, they give us instruments that are more powerful, more capable, more sensitive. Uh, they can see all sorts of chemicals in, in water and fish tissue and soil down at really, really low levels, right? So there actually happens to be lots of chemical detections, I think, especially in stories that end up in the media that derive simply from the fact that we have instruments that are so powerful that we can now see our synthetic chemical fingerprint everywhere, right? And um, as an example, of where we find chemicals. I put up this study here that was led by James Meter. He's actually uh, a scientist at NOAA at the Montlake Lab just down the street. He collaborates with a UW researcher named Evan Gallagher. And earlier this year, they put out this paper called Contaminants of Emerging Concern in a Large Temperate Estuary, that basically being Puget Sound. And that article got a lot of attention in places like the Seattle Times because there were 
headlines like drugs found in Puget Sound salmon from tainted wastewater. What the Meta Research Group did is they went and analyzed municipal wastewater from a couple places in Puget Sound. They looked at the Puget Sound itself as the receiving water. And then they analyzed tissues from salmon and sculpin for a wide variety of synthetic chemicals. These are things like surfactants and antibacterial compounds and illegal drugs like amphetamine, things like caffeine, a um, whole bunch of pharmaceuticals. And maybe not surprisingly, these compounds are found to be pervasive in all the samples they looked at, often at those low nanogram per liter detections that we felt were reasonable and kind of expected for uh, trace contaminants out in the environment. If you had tried to do this study 10 or 20 years ago, lots of these detections wouldn't be there. The analytical power just wasn't there to really see these compounds. So always realize a little bit that some of the detections we hear about and read about come from really low levels and powerful instruments. That being said, it is really interesting to think about the fact that our salmon and our sculpins are actually kind of full of the chemicals that we're producing and using and discharging out into the environment. That's a problem that we're struggling to understand. Um, is it bad for those organisms or, or not? I'll talk about that in a couple minutes. We also have broader detection capabilities. Um, our analytical instruments give us the capability to detect chemicals really broadly. We don't actually need a targeted method anymore. We just buy a standard and really optimize a specific instrument just to see that compound out in the water. We have analytical instruments like high resolution mass spectrometry instruments. This is the QTOF that it's down at the Center for Urban Waters that my research group uses all the time. And they give us capabilities for broad spectrum screening. Here I put up some data where we looked at municipal wastewater, right? And if we take a two liter sample of municipal wastewater and concentrate it down onto an extraction cartridge, we can actually detect 11,600 compounds in that single sample. Now lots of these are actually natural products and things that would be there even if humans weren't around. But this, this number of detection tells us that there are thousands and thousands of synthetic chemicals that came from people in um, basically sources like municipal wastewater. So what we're tra trying to do in my research group is look at all these detections, figure out what chemicals are there, which ones are at high concentrations, which ones might be toxic, which ones should we worry about the most, so maybe we can build better treatment processes to remove them before they enter the environment. This really, these detections are really our library that we look through to try and understand chemical occurrence out in the environment. So is this pollution important? Well, I think it's really clear that we have some excellent cases where it's evident that poor water quality has some really problematic effects, especially when you consider aquatic organisms. And a good example of that is uh, of acute toxicity is what's called pre-spawn mortality in coho salmon. So researchers at NOAA and here at UW and Washington State University Puyallup and um, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife have been working on this problem for the last 10 or 20 years. Because what happens is that here in the fall, right around the October, November timeframe, really right now, when adult coho salmon come up into urban creeks to try and spawn and reproduce, um, if it happens to rain when they're in those urban creeks, many of them end up dying within about one to four hours. And that's because there's some toxic chemical or chemicals in that urban stormwater that the coho are just very sensitive to, and it basically kills them, right? In some places in the Puget Sound region here, up to 90% of the coho salmon that return to these urban creeks end up dying from the pre-spawn mortality phenomena. So it's really clear that at least some of the synthetic chemicals we're putting out into the environment have some really problematic impacts. You have to recognize that if you're killing an adult fish, a big adult fish, in one to four hours, that's a pretty powerful, that's a pretty potent toxicant that's floating around out there that we're probably going to need to do something about. So one thing my research team is actually doing is we're trying to link this pre-spawn mortality phenomena to, to specific chemicals. Um, people have been trying to understand the cause of this toxicity for a while, haven't really nailed it down yet. So the toxicant or toxicants that cause this phenomena are currently unknown, but they're probably correlated, like highway runoff, what roadway runoff might be part of the story. So what we're trying to do is use some of those strong analytical capabilities in that broad spectrum screening we're trying to understand which chemicals are actually in this urban stormwater, and then we're looking at chemical uptake into the fish that are dying from pre-spawn mortality phenomena. So we're doing things like pairing stormwater samples with 
gill samples and samples from kidney and liver and heart and brain from coho salmon that basically died after that exposure to understand the, the flow of chemicals from the environment into organisms, especially to try and figure out which ones of those are toxic and problematic. So when we do that type of screening, right, we look for all these suspect toxicants or things we expect to be in stormwater. Um, in these salmon, we start with a list of, in this case, 79, right? There's 79 things we expect to find in stormwater or we think might be toxic to fish. And we look for them, and we actually can find 24 of those toxicant candidates that are detected not only in that highway runoff, but are now entering the fish after the fish are exposed to these chemicals. At least nine of our toxicant candidates are detected in all the, the tissue samples from those fish that died from pre-spawn mortality, as well as the stormwater. And so for us, this is a little bit of a uh, part of the puzzle for understanding what's causing this acute toxicity effect, right? We're really building the analytical tools to watch toxicity in action. And I'm hopeful um, that if we continue these efforts to understand what chemicals are in all these um, different environmental compartments, if we couple that knowledge with insight into the biological mechanisms of toxicity, we might be able to narrow down our list to a specific toxicant that we can understand its occurrence in stormwater and we can do something to treat it and remove it to make these systems better for salmon. So acute toxicity, you know, uh, it's a compelling example, but it's actually on the rare side. Um, here in the US, we've actually fixed a lot of acute toxicity problems for aquatic organisms. What's much more typical is actually sublethal impacts. This is what's really quite commonly observed when you think about synthetic chemicals getting out in water and affecting aquatic organisms. So as an example here, I use the fish on Prozac example. This came out of Brian Brooks Research Group in 2003, where he looked at the environmental occurrence of a chemical called fluoxetine. That's this chemical here. It's really commonly used as an antidepressant, right? It's the active ingredient in Prozac. So here in the US, we have about 25 million prescriptions for Prozac. Everybody on Prozac is taking about 20 milligrams per day, and our per capita discharge is about 7.3 grams of fluoxetine per person per year. So not all that different from that ibuprofen mass balance that we did earlier. Fluoxetine ends up being ubiquitous in wastewater because of that pervasive use. And like many other synthetic chemicals, there's actually little or no removal during wastewater treatment. In many cases, wastewater treatment plants were not designed to remove synthetic chemicals, so they kind of remove them only accidentally. We haven't really intentionally tried to remove lots of these chemicals from sources like municipal wastewater. So really, we probably shouldn't be surprised that fluoxetine is subsequently detected in fish uh, that are living downstream of those municipal wastewater um, plant effluents. In fact, when researchers look, they can actually detect fluoxetine in the brains of fish that live downstream from these municipal wastewater treatment plants. And the concentrations in those fish brains are actually really close to the concentrations that are pharmacologically active in human brains. So that's telling us that fluoxetine is not only going from our wastewater, it's going into the fish and into their brains and probably having some effects like antidepressant effects in the aquatic organisms exposed to this compound. When researchers reproduce this phenomenon in the lab, they find that these types of fluoxetine exposures reduce the fecundity of fish. So that reduces the capability of fish to reproduce the total quantity of reproductive output that they have. It alters their gene expression. It makes male fish more aggressive. Their ability to capture prey seems to decrease, and their mating success goes down. So this is really typical for sublethal effects. And I could show a similar slide with all sorts of different compounds and all sorts of different aquatic organisms here. These are cases where nothing dies, right? There's no fish up dead on top of the water. There's no cancer here. But important things like reproduction and gene expression and the way these animals behave and interact with their environment are being changed because of our exposures to the synthetic chemicals that we're putting out in the environment. The real challenge for us as researchers is quantifying these. How do we make people care that you know, your behavior or mating success or fecundity changes a little bit if you're an aquatic organism? And really the more important question is do these types of sublethal impacts lead to smaller populations? From an ecological perspective, that's really the qu critical question for us to try and figure out because it's important to 
answer that question so we know which chemicals we should be managing aggressively. Potential impacts on humans, right? Everybody's always interested, well, what, what's it going to do to me? What's the problem for me? And so um, I think it's quite clear that there's plenty of low-level exposures to humans of things like pharmaceuticals coming through indirect water pathways. And the example I used here is one that was published by a Dutch research group led by Houtman. And the paper was called Human Health Risk Assessment of a Mixture of Pharmaceuticals in Dutch Drinking Water. And the key phrase in that study was unplanned indirect potable reuse. So let's take a look at what that is, right? Here I have a USGS sewer service map. And uh, ba basically the Pacific Northwest here, the Columbia River Basin. And it's a little hard to see here, but you look up in these watersheds and you see these little green areas, right? These are areas with sewer service. And it's really typical here in the United States and throughout the world that you have an upstream community that pulls water out of the river, uses it, drinks it. After we're done with it, it goes to the sewer system, we treat it, we put it back in the river. It gets diluted with some other water, it flows downstream, the next community pulls it up, uses it as drinking water, treats it, puts it back. The same thing happens again and again as that water flows downstream, right? So we actually, that's what unplanned indirect potable reuse is. It just means that there's a community upstream of you. So my message here for everyone is that everybody is downstream of somebody else. Somewhere there's a wastewater effluent or a septic system upstream of you, and we should probably kind of get comfortable with that fact. That's the reality of a crowded world, right? And the other theme there is that also that all water is reused. Water is actually four billion years old. It's been here since, you know, the earth was formed. I have a colleague who likes to say, all water is reused. It was all dinosaur pee at least once and probably thousands of times, right? So maybe you should think about that next time you have a nice, tall, cold glass of water. Back to pharmaceuticals and water, right? One way of evaluating the risk of these trace exposures is to compare the concentrations we see in drinking water, that's all these bars right here, for a whole range of pharmaceuticals that Houtman detected in that Dutch drinking water with the pharmacological dose, which is basically the very top of the figure. So if you get up near this risk level line, right, that basically says, well, the concentrations in drinking water are close to the doses you would receive if you took that pharmaceutical as part of a prescription. And what you can see, this is basically, a uh, note that this is orders of magnitude. This is a log axis, right? It's really typical that the concentrations of pharmaceuticals in our drinking water are many orders of magnitude below the pharmacological dose levels. So from a big picture perspective, that tells us we probably don't have a lot to worry about with these exposures as humans. The health risks for humans are likely minimal, but it's really tough to prove safety. And a lot of people are kind of challenged by that. How do you prove something is really safe? It's not an easy thing to do. And I would say when you look at the scientific literature as a whole, there's no clear sublethal impacts evident for humans through water pathways. That story might change a little bit when you look at chemical uh, exposures around your home or through your food. So here's an example from late October titled The Human Cost of Chemical Exposure. And it has this interesting paragraph in here. Long-term, low-level exposure to endocrine-disrupting chemicals costs the U.S. $340 billion, that's with a B, in annual healthcare spending and lost wages, according to a recent epidemiological study, right? So that's a, an attention-grabbing headline. When you look at the data that was published there, you see that most of those economic costs came from things like PBDE flame retardant exposure. PBDEs are these compounds here. They have all these bromines on them. If you burn a PBDE, it basically creates a blanket of bromine gas over the fire and excludes oxygen. So PBDs are actually used really widely as flame retardants. The carpet in this room has them. The foam in the seats you're sitting on have them. Probably your sofa at home all has them. PBDs end up coming out of the foam. They're not chemically bound to the foam. You inhale them basically as household dust, and they enter your body. And we actually have exponentially increasing concentrations of PBDs in humans, uh, especially here in the United States. Well, PBDs are implicated in neural disruption. So there's a case to be made that PBD exposure results in intellectual disability. So this study that was recently published said the annual US prevalence might be 43,000 cases that result in 11 million IQ points being lost, which costs us $266 billion. 
You see a similar story here for organophosphate pesticides. These are things that you might find in your food. Again, they're implicated in neural development or, or altered neural function, which results in IQ points being lost and a big economic cost being associated with that. So for studies like this, there's a lot of splashy numbers there, but a lot of scientists would question some aspects of this data. It's really hard to put a value on things like intellectual disability. What does that really mean? How accurate can that estimate be? But I think I take home the big picture here. Even if all these numbers are wrong, right? PBDEs are things you're going to find in your home, where you're spending a lot of your time, where, where there's really a really complex mixture of synthetic chemicals around you. Organophosphates, agrochemicals are found in food. So there's a good case to be made that our most significant chemical burden comes from our exposures at home, and probably not through pathways like water. So steps toward resilient cities. Um, because I know my own research the best, I kind of like focused a little bit on research things I'm working on. Um, recognize there's a lot of steps we're taking as an environmental engineering and environmental science community toward resilient cities. So one thing I think we really need is better detection capabilities and treatment capabilities for high-risk chemicals, right? Here's an example here. Again, we're looking at pollutants in mun municipal wastewater with high-resolution mass spectrometry. If we look at the influent to a municipal wastewater treatment plant, we can detect 3,200 different chemicals in this particular sample, right? If we look at the effluent, the water coming out of the municipal wastewater treatment plant that goes out into the environment, we detect about 1,100 chemicals. 772 of them are the same as what we detected before. That tells us our engineered process removes about 2,400 chemicals. Maybe 70 or 80 percent of them are getting removed pretty efficiently. Concentrations also decrease. You see this difference, uh, you know, kind of the right side figure, the red is a little lower, the yellow is a little lower, the blue is a little lower. That tells us that the treatment plant is also removing some of the massive compounds, but it's also making some new compounds. There's 370 new compounds that are probably transformation products that are now entering the environment. So really our challenge as researchers is to look at all these chemicals and figure out which ones are most toxic. And once we figure out which ones are most toxic and problematic for aquatic ecosystems or humans, we can optimize our treatment technologies to do a really good, good job removing them. That's something that there's a lot of discussion and kind of, um, you know, we're trying to figure out as a community, should we be really putting a lot of investment into municipal wastewater treatment to treat these residual levels of contaminants that are still there, even when our case for their safety is really not fully defined? <coughs> Even better, something that would be far cheaper and more effective would be doing something like source control, removing them from production entirely. This is especially critical for non-point source pollution. Almost all non-point source pollution, things like urban stormwater, ends up being untreated. We simply can't implement treat systems across big land areas, right? So we're really going to need to look at source control as our management tool for synthetic chemicals in those environments once we understand which chemicals are most toxic. We're also dealing with the challenge of 85,000 different chemicals, right? And I can tell you, if screening chemical safety for 85,000 things comes down to little academic research teams, you know, a handful of students and a professor sitting in a room, or a group of 20 career scientists at EPA, um, we're never going to really attack this problem effectively. So one thing myself and some of my colleagues are doing is we're basically trying to build computational tools um, that allow us to accomplish in silico screening. And as an example here, we're trying to look at receptor and enzyme binding as a toxicity indicator. So there's a lot of money to be made making pharmaceuticals. And pharmaceutical companies for many decades have created algorithms and computational screening tools where they can take a specific molecule, there's actually a chemical sitting right in the middle of this, this big mix here, and try and understand if it binds to a specific drug target, like a protein or an enzyme or some nuclear steroid receptor. If you have a chemical that fits in that binding pocket correctly, you might have a drug, right? So pharmaceutical companies build these tools to find drugs. And in this case, uh, one of my collaborators, Ruben Abagian, who's down at the University of California, San Diego, has this pocketome screen which can screen different chemicals across 2,700 different protein drug targets. So we're trying to take these tools that were built for drug discovery, but now use them to identify environmental toxicants. We can take chemicals that we find out in the environment and put them in this receptor binding pocket and see if they start to fit as maybe a first step in understanding if they're toxic or not. 
I showed a few examples here of pharmaceuticals that you might expect to find in municipal wastewater. These are actually chlorinated transformation products. We actually chlorinate a lot of wastewater before we release it out into the environment, and that actually creates new products, right? So we've taken some of those new products and screened them against this, and we actually find that some of these new products do bind to things like the androgen receptor. That, this is androgen receptor here, or the progesterone receptor, or the mineral corticoid receptor. And that tells us a specific pathway that we might start to consider when assessing the potential toxicity of compounds like this. So we really need tools like in silico binding and computational tools to get a handle on the tens of thousands of chemicals we're making and using because our real challenge is to differentiate the high-risk chemicals, that small subset that might be toxic, from all the safe ones that the toxic ones kind of coexist with. I also think there's a real opportunity for us to bring strong engineering tools to non-point source pollution. This is especially important in the Pacific Northwest. We all know how much rain we get. We all know how much urban stormwater we're generating. So I pulled the headline here that came out early in October. To solve water pollution, Seattle turns to an old solution, right? And really what we see here is, is the typical urban rain garden, right? This is an example of low impact development. Things like urban rain gardens, bioswales, riparian buffers. These are all kind of like pretty simple tools that we're trying to use where, as means of improving the water quality of things like urban stormwater. And there's a good quote from that article. It says, the main tools are plants and dirt. It's like the newest, oldest technology. And as an engineer, I really appreciate how wonderful and simple plants and dirt are. But I can't help but look at a system like an urban rain garden and think we can do a better job than just mixing plants and dirt together, right? There's a lot of opportunities to look at these systems as engineered multiple barrier systems and optimize their performance, especially when we know which compounds in things like urban stormwater are most toxic and most in need of removal by our treatment systems. As an example of why this is important, the Puget Sound Partnership estimates that we're going to be spending $16 billion here in urban stormwater treatment. And that's still going to leave most of our urban stormwater untreated. So there's a real need for effective mechanisms here. We're going to be investing a lot of resources in those, and we need to make sure that those investments are smart and efficient. So a few closing thoughts, right? Why are we surprised? It's really the case that chemical uh, production leads to environmental pollution. So I put an example here, again, looking at pharmaceuticals. In 2009, there were $300 billion worth of pharmaceutical sales, right? Just a huge market. With a $300 billion market, $300 billion chemical production system, why is we surprised when we look at drinking water, we can see traces of pharmaceutical chemicals and hormones that have been detected in the drinking water of 14% of the nation, or 41 million Americans in 24 major metropolitan areas. With this big, huge production system, we shouldn't be surprised that 80% of the 139 streams that were sampled contained at least one pharmaceutical. So large market values, large productions, are going to imply the environmental occurrence of synthetic chemicals, either the chemicals themselves or something that's related to their production or something that's a transformation product of them. I think our big challenge as a research community is trying to understand what the real environmental risks of these types of actions are. Because it's really hard for us to look through big mixtures of chemicals and figure out which ones are most toxic and most problematic and most in need of engineered solutions. So our themes for human actions on synthetic chemicals, kind of wrapping up the things we've talked about today. Humanity, despite cautionary tales like DDT, seems to be repeating the same global scale chemical release experiments over and over. We take things like DDT out of production and we make a few simple substitutions, like put a bromine molecule in instead of a chlorine, and we make the same chemical and start releasing it again. So I think we're going to end up learning this lesson over and over again, right? We don't necessarily learn a lot from our cautionary tales. I think if you're an environmental engineer, we probably have a lot of good job security out there. Um, I'm really confident we're not going to kind of build our way out of our environmental problems. There's also a lot of thoughtless chemical pollution out there, right? We have lots of kind of small habitual actions but when you, you know, indi that individuals do, but when you scale them up to big communities and urban areas, they end up being really consequential and big sources of pollution to the aquatic environment. 
I also want you to know that our chemicals don't just magically disappear when we're done with them. They are left behind as that chemical fingerprint that we can detect kind of throughout our environment. And I think there are some cases, we're not sure which ones yet, but there are some cases where we're gonna expect some costly unintended consequences arising from that pervasive discharge of chemicals out to the environment. So we have a lot of work to do to try and maybe head off some of those unintended consequences before they happen. Our big challenge as a research community is understanding which few chemicals are toxic. Probably 95, 98, maybe even more than 99% are probably totally safe for humans and ecosystems. But there's a few bad actors in there, and we really need capabilities to sort through our synthetic chemical mixture and find out which ones are the real problems. When it comes to water, ecosystem impacts are definitely more immediate and concerning, right? You're a tiny little fish egg in water, you're immersed in water you know, all the time, you have no liver, no capability to detoxify chemicals. Um, you have a real problem with trace chemical exposures or all these synthetic compounds we're putting out in the environment. If you're a big human, right, there's seven billion of us on Earth, we have good livers, um, we can manage chemicals, I think, a little more effectively than aquatic organisms. So really, these ecosystem impacts are kind of the, the place where all the action is happening when thinking about synthetic chemicals in water. And finally, chemical production drives environmental release. Maybe if you're concerned about chemical production or chemical burden or your exposures to chemicals, you should think about what you do and use at home. That's really the place where you're probably exposed to the widest array of synthetic chemicals and maybe a place where some unintended consequences might pop up. And finally, I put one last one here in light of the election last week, right? Environmental regulations are there to maintain our health and quality of life. And that's something we shouldn't forget. It's really easy for us if we travel overseas and we visit places that have lax environmental regulations or really don't enforce their environmental regulations or don't really care what they discharge out into the environment. It's easy to see for the people and ecosystems in those places that they have a distinctly different uh, health profile and quality of life relative to places that do use uh, strong environmental regulation. So think carefully about what we're gonna do in this arena over the next few years. We might, we might have some opportunities to get a little excited about environmental regulations in the next few years. A few acknowledgements, I'd really like to thank all my collaborators and my research group. These are all my current students here at UW, either UW Seattle or UW Tacoma. Um, I'd like to thank the National Science Foundation, the USDA and the EPA for funding, as well as a few other funding agencies. And I especially like to thank the UW College of Engineering, the UW Tacoma Division of Science and Mathematics and the Center for Urban Waters, which are all places where I do lots of work. So that's what I have today. Thank you for coming. If you have any questions, please let me know. <laughs>